When talking about photography in the 1950s, it'd be easy to argue that the 35mm rangefinder was the camera of the decade. Pretty much the entire decade was defined by what I would call a rangefinder war between various manufacturers kind of coming out of the ruins of World War II. You had in Japan Canon with the Canon P, for example. You had Nikon with their S's, S1, S2, S3. And then in Japan, you had Zeiss Icon with their post-war contacts line. And then of course, Leica starting the decade with the Barnack Leicas and then moving on to the legendary Leica M3. Another brand that deserves mentioning in this rangefinder war happens to be one of the more historic brands and also one of the highly regarded brands, yet they kind of came out as a big loser in this rangefinder war. The brand I'm talking about is Voigtlander, and the camera I'm talking about is the Voigtlander Prominent. During the 1950s, Voigtlander had a few rangefinder cameras to choose from, starting with the Folder Vito, and then you had the very funky Vitessa, and then finally the less common Voigtlander Prominent. The Prominent would have been the premier rangefinder of the bunch, yet it lost out to brands like Leica in the end and has become largely forgotten. When the Prominent first came out in the early 1950s, it was really on par with the other rangefinders at the time with the Barnack Leica and the Contax. All three had the standard winding knob, coupled rangefinder, really small viewfinder, and a fantastic line of lenses. What made the Prominent different, however, is that the focus was not in the lens or on that funky little thing that kills your finger. Instead, it was on the upper left corner of the camera up top. Another thing that made the Prominent a little different is that it actually used a leaf shutter as opposed to a focal plane shutter. And what this meant is that you could actually use a flash with this camera at varying shutter speeds, whereas with the Leica contacts and the focal plane shutter, you're only stuck with one speed. Also, on the opposite end though, this meant that really the shutter was gonna be maxed out at 1 500th of a second, whereas the Leica and the contacts could get a little extra one thousandth of a second. One major downside for the Prominent is that it has its own separate lens bayonet, which means it has a really limited line of lenses to choose from, really only four focal lengths total, seven lenses in the whole range, and you know, compared to Leica, which is almost infinite, that's a huge difference. Nonetheless, it's a Foytlander lens you're dealing with, so you're gonna get Foytlander quality. The lenses that I have with my Prominent are the 15mm f2 Ultron, as well as the 35mm f3.5 Scoperon lens. I would love to try the 15mm f1.5 Nocton lens, as well as the 24mm Ultragon lens. But at this point, the Nocton is quite expensive, and Ultragon I've never even seen a photo of, so it could be just an urban myth at this point. Jumping back into the history of the Prominent and the Rangefinder Wars, we go to the mid-1950s. Leica has come out with the M3, completely camera of the decade, outclassed all the other rangefinders in so many ways. And Foytlander actually knew this and they did come out with an upgraded Prominent 2, which had actually a way bigger viewfinder with frame lines for 35 millimeter 50 and 100 millimeter. So actually it's a little better because it has 35 millimeter wide, which M3 only had 50 at the widest. And just like the early M3s, the Prominent 2 also had an actual film advance lever instead of the knob, and this was a double stroke. In the end, these improvements to the prominent weren't enough to stave off the inevitable, and the inevitable, of course, was the SLR. By the start of the 1960s, the prominent was no longer being produced. The contacts soon followed. Really, it was only Leica who were producing their interchangeable rangefinder cameras. Everyone pretty much just jumped over to the SLR. Now with that history lesson done, let's actually take my camera and the lenses out and show you just what the hell it'll do in the field. Another beautiful day here in Lassa National Park. It had snowed yesterday, but it's not so white in the trees, especially as I was hoping. Nonetheless, it's a nice day, it's not too cold, and it's a great time to test out the Foytlander Prominent. With me, I actually have some OG Fuji Color C200. This is the original stuff, not the Kodak made stuff. And I don't use it much, so I'm really curious just to see the results I'll get in a snowy condition. One thing I will say about loading this camera is that it's much easier than putting film in a Leica M3 or contacts. Loading a camera from the bottom or having to remove the entire back of the camera entirely can be a real pain in the ass. So just opening a film door the classic way is quite nice. Mm -hmm. 
for shot done. I can already tell that this is going to be a decent day of shooting with the prominent. Although Fuji Colors T200 is doing something weird with the green pine trees there, I do really like the contrast, the color rendition, and the sharpness coming from the 35mm scoper on. One thing I've noticed when using this camera is that the shutter requires a little extra pressure to fire and in doing so you can get camera shake because if you're holding the camera like this it's going to jolt a little bit. So what you want to do is make sure to have that second hand on the lens. This photo in particular is actually one that I really like from the day. Once again, I'm just really happy with the results I'm getting from this 35 millimeter scope on. At this point, I was really eager to try out the 50mm F2 Ultron. It's highly regarded lens as one I might imagine. It's just a classic Pointlander Prime. And I was really looking forward to just getting some slightly tighter compositions with these landscapes. Unsurprisingly, the 50mm F2 Ultron also shows great characteristics, color rendition, sharpness, and just the contrast. This is a 70 year old lens, but really I would stack this up with some of the new, more modern glass. In this photo, for example, I was shooting in some pretty harsh light, but the contrast was pretty great nonetheless. The lens coating also held up quite well, that means. And with most lenses from this era, really that bright sun would wash out a lot of that contrast. Once again, yearning for wider compositions, I switched back over to the 35mm scoper on and stuck with it for the rest of the day. This is another photo that I really like from the day. The moss on that center tree really helps bring a pop of color to an otherwise monochromatic landscape. And the lens characteristics of that 35mm scoper on, as well as the characteristics of Fuji C200, really helped elevate that golden green. By this time, some nasty storm clouds started to roll in, and I decided to get out of Dodge, kind of cut my day short in that regard. I'm pretty happy nonetheless with just going out and giving this camera some good usage. I will admit that the subjects are pretty similar here. I was only really in one location in Lassen National Park, but you know, at least I got some photos I'm happy with to begin with. Now moving on to my impressions of the camera, I will say having the focus knob on top made things a little funky for me, it really kind of slowed down the process, especially when one is also juggling with this viewfinder attachment on top. It might take just getting some used to, perhaps if I shoot a few more rolls, I'll get used to it. But nonetheless, it was a little funky having to toy around with that focus knob. I will also say the camera is a little hefty, which might surprise some because most rangefinders are known for being fairly compact and lightweight, but this one unfortunately is not. Nonetheless, the lenses, I was really happy with the results with just the um, Ultron as well as the scope around. Both lenses perform fantastically. As I've said before, the sharpness of these lenses as well as the contrast and color rendition just for a mid to early 1950s lens i would say this is nothing short of outstanding so i hope this video gave you a decent impression of the foitlander prominent and perhaps a little history of the camera and the rangefinder wars and i just hope to do a few more reviews of more niche lenses and cameras from this time so if you have any suggestions of just primo forgotten 1950s cameras, um, please let me know in the comments and check out my next video soon.